It's the question that haunts me always. It's the question that supersedes the theory of everything in physics, supersedes the origins and ends of the universe, supersedes the nature of consciousness, supersedes the existence of God. Though I ask it often, it's the question I never tire of asking. It's the question for which I seek expert ideas and ways of thinking. I must benchmark my beliefs, test my doubts. It's the question, the only question, that grounds me in the deepest foundations of reality. I cannot not ask this question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything at all? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Why is there anything at all? I seek every opportunity to immerse myself in the inscrutable enigma, explore its substance, enjoy its subtleties. I hear of a workshop on the apparent fine-tuning of the universe, a gathering of physicists, cosmologists, and philosophers. Do they also wonder, why is there anything at all? I decide to attend. The workshop is in Crete, whose simple beauty seems to resonate with the bracing impact of the ultimate question. I speak with participants, talk fine-tuning and cosmology. I look for an opportunity to spring my question. Because to explore fundamental physics is to appreciate quantum physics, I begin with a philosopher of science who focuses on foundations of quantum physics, Tim Maudlin. Tim, the question that has literally haunted me most of my life has been the classic, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything at all? The question of why there's something rather than nothing is not one that's ever bothered me because it seems to me pretty evident there can't be what you would consider to be a satisfactory answer to it. If I say, well, there's something rather than nothing because, the because is gonna mention something, right? It's gotta mention something existent. Uh, it can't be that there's something rather than nothing because of something non-existent. So then I'm begging the question, because then you're just going to ask me, but that thing you just pointed to, to explain the existence of everything, why does it exist? Right. And so you're obviously on a regress that's never going to end. So your claim is that the question itself is nonsensical? I think the, the question clearly is not one to which there can be a satisfactory answer, so you're wasting your time puzzling yourself over it. Yeah, it is in the range of possibilities, the possibility that there could have been nothing, absolutely nothing. It's not in the sense that people often talk about this. So as I say, I think there are mathematical facts, and in some sense or other mathematical entities. I don't think there's any possibility in which math isn't true. If you're asking physically, would there have to be a physical world, or is it physically possible for there not to be a physical world? To say it's physically possible for there for not to be a physical world is, of course, a kind of funny thing to say. You know, it's such an odd locution, I'm not quite sure even how to answer it. So if you would believe, for example, that the laws of physics or quantum physics or whatever below is the, is the, is the universe generator in some sense, I can imagine a condition where those laws weren't there. I mean, that's not hard to do. Yeah, you can imagine lots of things that can't happen. So you have to be a little careful so about going from your imagination to what's possible. Well said, uh, but now, now you use an interesting term that can't happen. That means something is necessary. Necessary in the philosophical sense. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, ne right, necessary so, in some serious so as sense. So as, as some people say, in any possible world, that has to be there. Right. There, there's no logical way that could right. not exist. Right. Okay, so if that's true, and that may be true, what populates that category of stuff that you've claimed, you know, can't not be? There are the things that we don't think of as contingent anyway, like mathematics, and I would claim certain moral claims are not contingent, about the physical world. I think you get into to tricky questions about could the laws of nature have been different. When we talk about physical possibility, we usually mean 
hold the laws of nature fixed. That's what makes it a physical possibility, is that it's in accordance with the laws of physics. So just by definition, in order to be physically possible, the laws have to be the same as the actual laws of nature. You can play a game of saying, well, what would happen if gravity had been an inverse cube law? I don't think I can ha have to take that as a serious possibility. I understand how that game is played. I understand that game, but, that, but that's a different game. This game says, is it possible for those laws of physics, whichever ones you want, not to have been at all? Right. It, are the laws of physics contingent right. as opposed to being necessary? Right. So, again, I think just by definition of physical possibility, it's not physically possible for the laws not to have been what they are. You know, well, what's possible in principle is so, metaphysically possible. Right. But it's inconsistent with the essence or nature of water. Could the laws of physics be, be not there not at all exist. in the same sense that you, you said with water? Because metaphysically, water could not be different than H2O. If you put a gun to my head and say, answer this question. I'm trying to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess I would say, no, I don't think it would be possible for there not to be laws of physics. Yeah. That's a view, that the laws of physics are necessary metaphysically. Yeah. Right. Um, and my reaction to that is, that's what an odd way for reality to be. <laughs> well, it, it, it's not odd for reality to have laws of physics. We're pretty sure they do. Tim's point I take seriously. Whenever we begin to try to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing, we must ground any putative answer on something, something that exists prior, like logic which makes the question circular and therefore self-refuting. I buy it, but I don't feel it. Rationally, I can see how to dismiss the question. Emotionally, I cannot escape its elusive appeal. I do not expect a real answer, but I persist. Now, to jump to make the laws of physics metaphysically necessary seems a leap too far. To me, such an aggressively materialistic answer, ironically, validates the non-materialistic force of the original question. I remain deeply unsatisfied, my angst compelling me forward. The claim is made that quantum physics has creation mechanisms, the power to bring a universe into existence literally from nothing thus transforming a philosophical question into a scientific one. While I'm suspicious of this kind of quantum-heavy nothing, I should hear out the mechanism. I speak with an advocate of quantum creation, attending the workshop in Crete, an expert on the structure of the universe, astrophysicist Mario Livio. Mario, why is there anything at all? So let me first say, I do not know why there is I would hope anything not. at all. I do not know. <laughs> However, there is one thing that I can say. The total energy of our universe is zero. Namely, there is positive energy that is in mass, in energy, radiation, and there is negative energy in gravity, and the two of those add up to zero, which means that our universe appearing out of nothing does not violate any kind of conservation of energy or something like this. Now, we also know that quantum mechanics allows for processes such as tunneling. If I have a barrier here and I send a particle here in classical physics, it would not pass through. In quantum mechanics, because the particle is more like a wave, there is a probability that it will pass through even if it doesn't have enough energy right. to overcome right. this barrier. So, since the total energy is zero and things can tunnel, then it is possible that even though there was something that you would call nothing, and I mean nothing at all, that could tunnel to a situation where you actually have a geometry, like our universe, still with zero energy. That is allowed by the laws of physics that we know. I don't need to invoke new laws of physics. Now, in physics, what we have learned that basically everything that is allowed happens. And so our universe could literally appear out of nothing for no reason. So there is no answer to the question why there is. Why? Because it could, not because 
you know, there was any purpose or, you know, any such thing. Now, to get a universe from nothing, you've described the process, but what you're starting with doesn't sound a lot to me like nothing. It sounds like the laws of quantum physics. It's nothing in the sense of that there is no geometry in particular, right. because our universe has a geometry. Yes, there's no geometry, but it is a geometry generating mechanism. If we have quantum physics, which is the generator, quantum physics is very complicated. It's I very believe. complicated. It, it is also in many, in many respects counterintuitive. Right. But it is complicated. It's something and it's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff. You have a, a mechanism to generate a universe with, with geometries and everything else, but you're starting with something pretty rich. Right, well, you start with some laws. Some laws, yes. Yeah. So you're right. So the question is, why are there some laws? And again, I don't know the answer to that. Yes, Mario, why are there some laws? Why the laws of physics? Especially why the laws of quantum mechanics, which seem fiendishly complex? Here's the big question. What's the reason for the existence of the laws of physics in the first place? Can the laws of physics be addressed from within physics itself? I asked the distinguished South African mathematician and cosmologist George Ellis. To George, the laws of physics do not exhaust reality. George, of all the questions, the deep question about why is there anything at all, the more you think about it, the dizzier you get. Because it's a deeper question, really, than the theory of everything in physics, or is there a god, or... Uh, how, how, as a physicist and as a believer, do you deal with this question? Um, I don't think physics can have anything to say about it, because physics assumes the existence of a whole lot of stuff. Physics assumes the existence of the laws of physics and something for it to act on. The, the whole of structure of quantum field theory, symmetry principles, all of that is assumed before you can even start physics. And so physics cannot make a beginning out of nothing because it requires all of that stuff, which would have to exist in some platonic sense before it could do anything. The underlying further question is that all of that physics depends on mathematics. If you take it in the standard way, that old question of the laws of nature are written in mathematical terms and so mathematics also in some sense has to exist before anything physical can exist. So I'm sure that physics itself can't answer this question, it's a philosophical question and at a certain level I simply don't know the answer at all. I think it's a, a really deep question. What I do know is that if people say that physics can explain why something come, came out of nothing, they're simply wrong because the structure of physics is not nothing. Mm. And so the existence of physics by itself has already said something exists. So this question actually deals with the uh, kind of the naive comeback of, you know, where did God come from or yeah, who yeah, created yeah, God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, the, the question, why is there anything at all, deals with questions of contingency and necessity. Yeah. Now, is there something that is a necessity that had to exist, as we say, in all possible worlds, no matter what? In terms of human thought, because of the way we think, we can keep drilling down, and at some point we just have to take a stand and say, here I stand, I cannot go any further. Mm. This is where I'm going to start my thought. Or equivalently, in, ma in, in logical thought, you have to start off with a set of axioms, and you just have to accept those axioms as being what they are. And so, so what are those axioms for existence? For you. If you take the classical theological position as Genesis 1, God existed, that's the ground, and other stuff follows from that. If you are a physicist and you refuse to go in that direction, then you have to assume the laws of physics. They're mm -hmm. eternal, unchanging, mm -hmm. omnipresent, mm -hmm. omnis, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so um, you have to say, that's my ground, the laws of physics is, but that's not enough to cause the universe come into being because the attempts which have been made are trying to use laws of what happens within the universe to describe how the universe itself came into existence. That may or may not make sense, but in any case, there's no way you can prove it was true. You can't get back, you can't rerun it. You can have theories of wave functions of the universe or of quantum foam or whatever. Nobody can ever test them. So we, you're in the domain where 
physics is giving way to philosophy. Even if you try to make it look like physics, it's actually philosophy. And a lot of physicists, though, would like to kill philosophy or say philosophy is dead. Or new stuff becomes good philosophy, then it becomes physics. Yeah, well, I think that a lot of my physics colleagues are very naive about philosophy. They are doing philosophy whether they know it or not. And if you don't think about the philosophy you're doing, you're just doing simple-minded philosophy. I agree with George. Why is there anything at all cannot even be addressed within physics, much less answered? Theology, of course, has its ready answer. But doesn't God just kick the question up a level? If God exists, why does God exist? There seems no conceivable answer. Can philosophy, sophisticated philosophy, save theology? I know the one person to ask, the orthodox philosophical theologian with a vast vision of God, David Bentley Hart. To meet David, I go to Notre Dame. David, my friends know that throughout my life I have been obsessed by the question of why something rather than nothing, and uh, uh, many, many people are as well. Um, your answer to that, I think I know, I, uh, that, that there is an absolute being that uh, you call God, and, and that God is a necessity. To me, that's, that's a great, that would be a great answer, but I don't, I don't see why that's the case. It, it's the classic question of ontology. Many different strategies down the centuries have been employed either to answer it or to evade it. Mm -hmm. Very popular strategies right now in uh, analytic philosophy uh, are to say that it's, it's a mistaken question because absolute nothingness is just one possible state among an infinite set of possibilities, all equipossible, you know. And therefore, and, it's zero probability. Right, I, I, I reject that because it assumes that there's equal weighting to, to a state of nothing and every one of those infinite well, possibilities. Right, then I, then I, I don't have to correct you, <laughs> which, which is good. Uh, it also mistakes nothing uh, as a modal qualifier as as being a physical state simply devoid right, of constituents. So, so, so get that off the so, table. No. I, I'm with you on that. Uh, well, in a sense, then, you already accept the principle even if you reject it. Because if you're willing to accept the existence of the universe as an ensemble of contingents, uh, the event itself of the existence of such a universe is something that, in, that in a sense, you have to leave unquestioned. You've just said uh, it can't be simply one possible state over against a, another possible state that is nothingness. Therefore, that the universe exists at all carries with it, it would seem, a certain logical necessity. It's not nothing. It, it, it's not nothing, but I, I, don't then, I don't then make the step to where it, 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 it becomes that there has to be some necessity. It, this, it, this could have just be the way things are, the, the brute fact, as, as they say. Yeah, you're using, you're using uh, the word necessity equivocally there. The claim of necessity is not that it needs to have been the case. The necessity here is purely ontological. If the universe if all that exists is, is a state of finite contingency and causal sequacity, <laughs> sequence, <laughs> if you try to explain how that can come to be, sooner or later in the deductive peregrinations that take you towards an answer, you're going to find that you have to make a choice. Are these contingent facts grounded simply in more contingency along an infinite regress? Or does there have to be that which is not contingent to allow for even the possibility of the contingent? Right, I think that's, that's and, a good question. And the second, I think, is the, is the logically inevitable correct answer for the simple reason that an entire system of contingencies is itself a contingent phenomenon. An order that's entirely contingent in its constitution down to its uttermost first causes require a first cause, not just, I don't mean temporally first, I don't mean prior, but about, um, the most fundamental cause itself would have to be contingent on what? 
it would simply be there, well, then it wouldn't be contingent, would it? It would, it would again, in some sense, be a, a factual necessity. But does that factual necessity explain itself any better than all the other contingencies of experience which ha require dependency? So I might agree with you that, that to have th that first cause in, in, in a logical sense, not, not necessarily a temporal sense, uh, I would agree that that being some kind of necessity has a better feeling to it, but I can't say that necessarily. What, what's the alternative? The, the, what you said, that, 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 the, that the first cause was a brute fact or a factual necessity. That's the way things were. Is that, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I was invoking that as a nonsensical answer. I'm sorry. Uh, a, a brute fact then that is a brute contingent fact that's contingent on nothing. You're talking then about an absolute contingency. It's, it's, it may be an attractive uh, uh, premise if one wants to avoid the other possible conclusion, right. but, I, but I don't see it as uh, okay. being able to survive much logical scrutiny. That first brute fact, if it's just a brute fact, like what? But what sort of fact then would we be talking about? Uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter. The question is, how do you characterize that? Do you, must you characterize that as a necessity? If it's the first brute fact, then I don't... Not if it's a contingent first fact, then, it, then it's contingent on something necessary. <laughs> so there is still a necessity well, you haven't reached yet. Well, you've added that point that you need to... Well, <laughs> that's because, because everything that's contingent is contingent on something. Otherwise, it's not contingent. If it's, if it's not contingent, then it's self-existent, in which case it's logically necessary. I want to go to, now to the second, the, the second big problem here, and that is if you accept... If, if, if now you got me, I'm, I'm going with you to the second point. Okay. I'm saying there has to be something that is necessity in order for, to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Is, why is there anything at all? Why then must that necessity be what you and, and the classical uh, traditions have called absolute being, which is your definition of God? Why does it have to be that way rather than some other way? Because the very definition of absolute being is absolute. That is, it's what's absolved of all the qualities of contingency. In that case, it's a deduction by negation. Uh, what is it that makes uh, something contingent? That is precisely what would be absent from the necessary. And okay. The, it's almost but, a tautology. Yeah. Sure. At the level of ontology, it is almost tautological. And there's no reason it shouldn't be. Okay. Because, because it's precisely that tautology, which should you think be, a, you, you might think be a simple deduction of reason, that's absent from, okay. from a, a, a lot of the Okay, the so, so I, I could go there. But then how do you put other characteristics on that that begin to look like your kind of God? Because I, 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 because I, the I don't think how asked. you can layer onto that tautology sure a, 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 a qualities that you would call God. No, because, because you ask the question of the absolute not only in terms of its ontological nature, but the way it underlies uh, the full range of, of human experience and of experience of the existence of the world, and that would include the structure of consciousness, uh, the way in which it seems to elude physical reduction, the way in which it seems to be pre preoccupied with transcendental lens. As I said, as long as you're asking the question only in terms of ontology, all you arrive at is the absolute, in a rather vacuous sense, perhaps, although that definition of absolute also has to contain, you know, an infinite capacity of being. So it's not, it's not entirely vacuous, but it, yeah, it's devoid of all the warm and inviting features of devotional <laughs> theism. But no picture of God is simply the product of ontological deduction. That's simply one of the aspects under which one asks the question of the relation of the ex of finite experience to its ultimate ends or its ultimate source. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything at all? Why does the question torment me? It doesn't. I luxuriate in it. As for the existential knot in the pit of my stomach, I like it there. There are multiple ways to approach why is there anything at all. Here are four. One, the question is not a normal question and cannot be answered normally. The laws of physics must be as they are. Two. The laws of physics can bring the universe into existence from a kind of quantum heavy nothing. Three, the question cannot be answered within physics, only within philosophy. 
Four, contingent causes, however vast the series, must terminate in something that is ultimate necessity. Each of these answers are attacked. For example, many philosophers see no logical contradiction in an infinite series of contingent causes. Moreover, one cannot leap from absolute being to the existence of God, much less to a personal God. So I always come home to the original question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything at all? I ask the question again and again and again and again, because I am driven to get closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.